Good evening and welcome to JT Online, our midweek Bible study. Good to see you this evening. Hopefully you're having a great week so far. And it's always a pleasure to be able to gather together uh, for our midweek Bible study together as part of our JT Online. My name is Pastor Mark and welcome, welcome, welcome. We kick off a brand new class tonight. That's right. We, uh, we had been over the summer going through the holiness of God, and tonight we kick off our Parables of Jesus study. So as everybody's kind of coming in, I want to encourage you to hit the like button, hit the share, uh, let your friends know about our study that we're getting ready to start. But also in the comments, go ahead and let us know what your favorite parable is. Go ahead and put in the comments what your parable is is. And uh, we'd love to, we'll get to that in just a minute and hear what your favorite parable is. Now, as I mentioned, our JT Online uh, kicked off uh, this this week, actually. We had our first class last night, and there are a whole bunch of other classes going on right now during this time. So we're grateful that you decided to be a part of our midweek Bible study. But um, just to let you know, there are other classes, and you can go to mcgregor.net slash journey to see a list of those other courses that are offered Uh, one on Tuesday, we have several on Wednesday, and then next week we'll actually have one of our women's ministry classes that'll meet on Monday night. Now, some of you may be watching and you're a regular and you're like, hey, Mark, it looks like you're somewhere different. Well, I actually am. Uh, I'm away. I'm out of town this week, but the show must go on. And so I actually have been looking forward to, to hosting the kickoff for the fall And, um, you know, with technology today, you can do these from wherever you are. So let me uh, welcome a few folks that are uh, here joining us. And I'm going to go back. Hey, Karen. And hey, Greg. Good to see you. Hey, Terry and Arnold. Debbie's joining us also. And Jacqueline. Uh, Barb, glad to have you here. Uh, And hey, Nancy, how are you doing? Hey, Karen. Good to see you. Hey, Todd. Good to see you. And Pamela. Becky. Michelle, lots of folks. Glad we have lots of folks. And now we've got some folks telling us what their favorite parables. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. I want to get uh, our Bible study teacher, Pastor Russell, in here with us right now. And we're going to uh, welcome him. Good evening, Pastor Russell. How are you doing tonight? I, I think I'm doing okay. If I manage, I think I've managed to turn my camera on and my mute off and, and all those other little things that you smart guys know how to do better than I do. But uh, I'm doing well. Thank you. Yeah, you look good. You look real good. <laughs> Sound pretty good too. <laughs> All right. All right, so Very let's cool. let's uh let's see uh what we've got here on some we asked folks and go ahead, it's not too late if you're joining us, go ahead and put in the comments what your favorite parable in the Bible is. And so I'm going to read a few of these that we've got. Um Becky Van Helden said prodigal son. Um lost sheep was uh Jackie said hers. Uh, Michelle <laughs> tells us any parable that Jesus tells us. All right, Michelle, way to give the non-answer there. That's uh, that's you know, good. Wow, <laughs> that's an irrefutable but uninformative answer. <laughs> yes, yeah, but that I love, doesn't. Su- I love me some Michelle, but that's, yeah, that's me too. Right. That doesn't surprise me. Uh, Terry says the lost coin. Ah, uh, that's a good one. And I'm trying to think. Uh, that's going to be one that we're we're going to be looking at. I think it might be. Um, Going to mustard seed, and some of them are very, very short. Uh, and there's all kinds right. of different types of uh, parables that are that are That's out right. there. We're going to talk about going to talk about that a little bit in a, in a few minutes. Um, that there are some categories. Yeah, uh, the sower of seeds, probably one of the more right. well-known uh, parables. Uh, hey, Joe and Carrie, glad y'all are joining us. Uh, Jeanette also said, I love all the parables. <laughs> oh yeah. All right. So that's, that's, what's your favorite? Do you have a favorite parable, Russell? You know, um, I haven't, I haven't been watching the comments, but, uh, for me, the parable of the workers in the vineyard, because it, it's, um, just says a whole lot about grace. Yeah. Um, not that, not that there are others that don't prodigal son does the good Samaritan does the grace is. Surprise, surprise, since grace is at the heart of the gospel, it's also in a lot of, uh, it comes up a lot in the, in the parable teaching of Jesus. Yeah, the, the, you mentioned the Good Samaritan, and that's, that's always been a, 
favorite, but I think part of the reason was when I was in sixth, I think it was sixth grade. It could have been fifth grade. Fifth or sixth okay. grade, we did our children's choir did a musical called Sam, and it was based off the Good Samaritan. And I can still to this day remember <laughs> some of the lyrics to some of those songs. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, I think you and I were both raised in sort of in sort of deep church. Uh, yeah. I mean, like like if we weren't at home, we were at church pretty much through the whole childhood. Oh yeah, I think very similar. You know, my my dad being a pastor and uh, and, and and being in seminary and being in a small church while he was in seminary, I think they had to drive you know a hundred miles to get to it, and they stayed in a little parsonage over the weekend, then came back to school during the week. But yeah, I was I was you know that very first Sunday after I was born, I was you know making so much noise. I think my dad had to stop the Sunday night service a little early. <laughs> So small, they didn't even have a nursery, Russell. Okay, okay. That's small. That's small. Or maybe on Sunday night they did. Maybe on Sunday morning they uh, they did. All right, so we're looking um, for the next 14 midweek Bible study studies. We're looking at parables, the parables of Jesus. And we have, we have chosen to look specifically at parables found in Matthew's gospel. Now, obviously, there's there's... Other parables that we won't touch on that uh, would be found in the other Gospels. But if you look at Matthew, we actually had more than 14 to choose from. You remember looking at the list <laughs> that I pulled from. And there was, there's, there's a, Matthew, I think, has the most parables of any of the Gospel writers. So, so we chose to stay just in Matthew. And I thought it would be good that we explain that we don't have a book that we're going through. We did a book back when we did The Holiness of God. And I say a book that was kind of the, the, the outline for our study for those seven weeks. But we don't have a book. However, there are some good resources out there. And I'm going to have you share one in just a moment, and then I'm going to share one. But before we do that, I also want to let people know that if you signed up for our midweek Bible study, if you registered, and I hope you do register, you can go online again to mcgregor.net slash journey and, and register for this class. You'll get an email every week letting you know in advance what we're going to be studying on Wednesday night. So for those of you that like to know ahead of time so you can do your own preparation, which I would always encourage that, then you register for this midweek Bible study, mcgregor.net slash journey, and you'll get that email every week letting you know what we're going to be studying that week. All right, so Russell, give them, give them a, a, a resource that's been very helpful for you in, in studying the parables. Yeah, really so, um, and, and, and even broader than that. And I'm going to go really broad and then kind of broad and then, and then deal with the specific matter at hand because that's how I do things. Really, really broad. We're never, we're never going to mind recommending uh, books to you guys. Disciple is just a fancy biblical word for student. And students are learners. And, and books are, are a really important part of, of being an effective student learner. Um, and, and I know, uh, I think Mark, you, you, you almost always go digital. You're, 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 if you, if you can get a book in its digital format. Absolutely. Yeah. I still am probably two thirds analog. If I'm just reading something for fun, I'll buy it digital and throw it on my Kindle, but I like to mark up physical books and things like that. At any rate, guys, we're never going to be, um, reticent or, or slow to recommend books. Now, the book I'm going to recommend is broader than just parables. I'm recommending the book in conjunction with this study because the chapter on parable is outstanding. But the, the book deals with pretty much every type. You know, the Bible is a collection of, of 66 different written documents. Some began life as letters and, and some began life as historical narratives that were written and circulated. The, uh, prophecy song books. Uh, there's a hymnal. The book of Psalms is a hymnal. Um, so you have different different types of, of uh, literature tied up in Scripture. And and uh, I don't remember if this shows up mirror image or forward on the screen. Okay, by the time it's coming out. It the shows up right. Forward. Yeah, it's, it's perfect. Yeah. Um, I don't. This book has been through several editions. This is the third edition. It may look different than this now. But the book is How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. Um, and it's, the authors are Fee, F-E-E, -E, like you, you pay a fee, same thing, Gordon Fee, and Doug Stewart, S-T-U-A-R-T, Fee and Stewart. In fact, if you went into any seminary, 
classroom and mentioned Fee and Stewart, the professor's going to smile and nod. I don't agree with every single conclusion that Fee and Stewart reach in their examples throughout the book. I, I don't think they're they're uh, Baptists. They are Bible believers. They're, they're conservative. The book is absolutely worth owning. And uh, if you want a neat study on how to study different types of book within the Bible, because you know intuitively you don't handle Proverbs like you handle epistles. You don't handle epistles like you handle Psalms. You, don't, you already know that intuitively if you've been around the Bible much. The chapter on parable in Fee and Stewart is entitled The Parables, Do You Get the Point? And as a short treatment on, on the how of, of correctly interpreting parables, there's nothing I've ever read that's any better on that specific thing. Although, Mark, you've got a great recommendation as well. But um, if you're collecting books and you would like a great book on general Bible study, Fee and Stewart, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. Yeah, I, I would uh, echo that endorsement. That is a book that I go to quite often and have read. I know my wife also enjoys that a lot. The second one is uh, a book by John MacArthur, and it's called Parables. So we'll pull it up on the the iPad there. <laughs> I don't know if I can get close enough. Uh, but it's got a big uh, big sheep there. The mystery, Parables and Mysteries of God's Kingdom Revealed Through the Stories Jesus Told. Now this one is actually, he spends some time uh, going through and looking at quite a few parables and, and actually studying them. But the, he has an opening chapter in the book uh, that is called Sloppy Thinking About the Parables. And I know, Ooh, Russell, that... Great chapter. Dude. Yeah. Parables have often suffered the fate of being misrepresented, misinterpreted. Um, talk to me a little bit about that problem when it comes to specifically studying parables. You know, the good news is several several times right in the text of the Gospels, uh, we, we have enough uh, narrative around the parable, enough of a setting. Uh, that, that lots of times, even in the Gospels, we have the aftermath, and the people that heard the parable for the first time reached shockingly bad conclusions about what the parable was really about. <laughs> right. A lot of the parables began life uh, with, with, with um, hearers who didn't know what they were hearing. They're not meant to be. They're not meant to be hyper mysterious, hard to understand, or mysterious. They're also generally, and there are a couple of exceptions, <clears throat> and Jesus made these exceptions, and we'll probably encounter some of them in these in these studies. They're not allegories. The biggest single mistake people make, well-meaning people make in interpreting parable, is they try to make it an allegory where everything in the parable stands for something else. One of the most classic early abuses, um, uh, St. Augustine of Hippo, uh, for whom St. Augustine Florida is named, a second century church father, uh, a lot to like in the writing of St. Augustine. But he did, a, he did a treatise on the parable of the Good Samaritan. And the, uh, the Samaritan was Paul, the inn was the church, the person buying every single, the donkey <laughs> had some, I mean, every, every single piece of, he went real granular, and every single piece of the parable was made to stand for something else. And that's just not how parables function, generally. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a misunderstanding. And then, um, again, you, you, got, you, got to get, you got to get the point of the parable, and we're going to talk about that some in a few minutes. All right. Well, let me, uh, let me have a word of prayer and uh, pray for you and pray for those folks that are watching tonight that this would be fruitful time of Bible study for us all. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to gather. Thank you for the opportunity to do this in a, in a, in a virtual way. And yes, we would much prefer to be in person on campus studying your word. But uh, for now, this is, this is the best alternative we have, and we're so grateful for it. And right now, I just pray for Pastor Russell. I pray, God, that you would use him. I know he is prepared. Um, again, he always comes uh, to teaching your word with a, with a passion and a desire to communicate the truths of your word. And God, just use him tonight. Pray for us that our hearts would be open to receive that and to hear that and to be instructed and to be challenged uh, as we study the word of God together. Again, use this time for your glory. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Russell. You, Thanks, buddy. Um, one, of the, one of the central rules of interpreting all Scripture, and you can, you, can, you can just write this at the top of the 
top of the page of, of any, any, you know, where you're going to be taking notes or where you're doing private Bible study. One of the central truths of interpreting scripture is it, it does not mean what it could not have meant. Uh, drilling back to original meaning is the beginning point of understanding current meaning. Uh, that's really, really important. That's even important in, uh, in things like the book of Revelation, where people want to turn, you know, a, a, a particular beast in a particular chapter of Revelation, and they want to put up a picture of a modern army uh, combat helicopter and say that, that, that John on Patmos was writing about Apache AH-64 helicopters. That's just hogwash. Um, it, it cannot mean what it did not mean. So you have to be very, very careful um, generally in handling, handling Scripture. That's really, really true in parable. V and Stewart make this plain in their chapter, and I absolutely agree with them. The main task of interpreting parable, the main thing is to get to what the people who first heard it heard. You know, one low hanging fruit example for us is uh, those of you who have, have been around the word of God a lot and the Wednesday night uh, journey together online audience. We, we pretty much assume we're talking to people who, who have a, a general working familiarity with the Word of God as a baseline. I know sometimes our new believers will hop in on this, and I'm glad, and our newest members will hop in, and I'm glad. But a lot of you are, are life group teachers and longtime uh, disciples and students of the Word of God. One of the things that you and I, um, when we hear the word, when I hear the word Samaritan, I almost automatically stick good in front of it. Like it's, a, like it's almost a hyphenated word, the Good Samaritan, the Good Samaritan. And I've heard Good Samaritan all my life. I didn't, I didn't do a children's choir musical like Pastor Martin, uh, you know, where I sang about him. But, but I'm certain there were flannel board cutouts telling the story of the Good Samaritan in my, you know, four-year-old Sunday school class way back in the day for me at First Baptist Church of Jacksonville Beach, Florida. The Good Samaritan, the Good Samaritan, the Good Samaritan. But the whole point of the parable. Um, the 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 punchline of that parable, so to speak, is that the good people kept walking and left the guy that was beaten up and and messed up in the ditch on the side of the road. The 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 priest and the Levite and 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 they kept walking, and and finally this Samaritan. And when Jesus was first telling that story, you can bet when he when he made a Samaritan the hero of that story, he got gasps and dirty looks, and um, the very fact that, that they understood him to say the person who was helpful is the person that everyone in this audience would despise the absolute most. The, the despicable, low-life Samaritan becomes the hero of the story because he knows um, what it is to love his neighbor. Uh, it it's important for you and me to get past our our present day orientation and try to get into the mindset of those first hearers. That's the first task of parable interpretation, to hear it as closely as we can, to hear it the way those original uh, hearers heard it. Um, now, as we dig into parable, and, and Mark and I talked about this briefly a moment ago, there are different types of parables we'll be looking at through this study. Uh, Fee and Stewart give us names for some of these categories. Well, what they call a true parable is, is a story, a story that has a sort of a, a plot line, a beginning, middle, and end. We, we have a setup. We meet some characters. Um, the, the Good Samaritan is a classic one. The Prodigal Son is a classic one. The Workers in the Vineyard is a classic one. These are, these are little, little stories. That, that again, they, they have a plot line that flows through a beginning, middle, and end. And uh, the, the task of interpreting those correctly really comes down to allowing simplicity to prevail. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, Fee and Stewart, and again, I believe correctly, uh, make, make parables. They, they point out that a parable in a lot of ways is analogous to a well-told joke. A stand-up comedian who's telling a joke really well will first introduce the joke and give you those common points of reference that you in the audience are going to understand. Uh, you know, people people like uh, Tim Hawkins who tells a lot of, of church jokes when he when he because he goes to churches a lot. He 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 can start with 
So one morning the pastor came in and he was up front and everybody in his audience knows what it's like when the pastor comes in, knows when he's up front. They, we, uh, we join that frame of reference and we have a certain set of expectations. And what makes the joke funny is that somewhere through the unfolding of the story, the, 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 the normal, familiar elements that are those points of reference that we understand suddenly take a turn we didn't expect. And, and the joke is funny. Parables do the same thing. They take they, these story parables. They take these, these common frames of reference that Jesus and his original hearers had that we can come in 2,000 years after the fact and come to understand as well. Take those common frames of reference and unfold it like I, I alluded earlier and have several times the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Nobody expects Everybody gets, I show up at work at dawn with an expectation that I'm going to make a day's pay. And then some guys come in at nine and some guys come in at noon and three. And then some guys come in an hour before quitting time. And then at the end of the day, everybody gets paid the same thing. Well, every single one of us have the frame of reference necessary to follow the pieces of that parable and to sort of catch the punchline. Something really unexpected happens. And that unexpected thing is the point of the parable. It is not appropriate to say, well, this person stands for this, and this person stands for this, and this person stands for this. And it, it's like a joke. If you start dissecting, almost doing a, if you do an autopsy on a joke, it means the joke is dead. It's not funny. If you just let the joke roll out at its own pace and punch when it punches with its twist, it's going to be, generally, it's going to be funny. The parable is going to function the same way. If you just let that story unfold and let the punch land where Jesus landed it, making certain that you've understood enough about the original setting to hear what the hearers were hearing. That's that's story parables. The other types, in fact, one of the ones we're doing, to, the one we're doing tonight is more of a metaphor. Uh, when Jesus says this is is like this, the. Um, you 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 are um, you are the salt of the earth. Well, certainly he didn't mean to say that his followers were, you know, sodium chloride and a shaker waiting to come out on your potatoes. Um, he he grabbed a, a very short, a very short illustration, a metaphor and, 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 and applied it to a situation. And then another type is a is what's called a similitude. It's almost like a little proverb that speaks to everyday occurrences. When Jesus talked about a little bit of yeast leavens the whole uh, lump of dough, everybody in his audience that was familiar with how careful Jewish households have to be when they're trying to get unleavened bread to very thoroughly get rid of all the leaven. He entered into the, the, the daily experience of his hearers and, and basically almost coined a proverb based on something very commonly understood. And those are kind of the three major categories. There are some subcategories if we wanted to get real academic, but, but the true parables um, and then these, these, these quick metaphors and then these, these similitudes that function almost like proverb. Um, the main takeaway I want you to get from this section is this, that we're not trying to make every single piece of every parable stand for something. That's called allegorization, and parables generally are not allegory. All right, for tonight's parable, we turn to Matthew chapter 7, and it's, a, it's a, somewhere between a similitude and a metaphor. It's probably more of a metaphor because what Jesus describes is not an everyday occurrence. We do not walk around with beams stuck in our eyes. Now, I've been reminded twice today uh, by, by elders with long memories. Years and years ago, if you were at McGregor years ago, and I, uh, I, uh, I'd have to ask Pastor David Miller what year this was, preached, I think, on this very passage on a Sunday morning at McGregor. And he had, he had some kind of hat, as I recall. And the gimmick of the hat is the hat had a built-on board sticking out of your eye as an attachment to the hat. Um, and um, and uh, so David wore as a visible illustration sort of the ridiculousness of what Jesus is saying. We're inside the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is speaking to a, a large audience of, of spiritually lost people. And he's describing overall 
the 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 overall flow of the Sermon on the Mount is the is, is it's a sermon about life in the kingdom of God. Uh, the kingdom of God is the is the already and not yet. The full realization of the kingdom of God happens when Jesus returns to earth and reigns. Uh, the kingdom of God is present on earth today because Christ has followers on earth that are the active representatives of his kingdom. And so he's both he's describing a future ideal throughout the Sermon on the Mount. He's also coaching his present day followers in that day and this how to live in a way that effectively reflects the values of the kingdom. First five verses of Matthew 7. Judge not that you be not judged for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Um, or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye. And then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Now, see right away, that's not a similitude. A similitude is, again, things like a little bit of, of yeast leavens the whole up. It's day-to-day it's -day occurrences. People don't walk around with logs sticking out of their eyes. It's a, it's a deliberately absurd metaphor uh, to amplify a, a single point. And that is be, be more aware, not less of your own uh, character faults and struggles and specific uh, issues that could stand to be corrected, pay those more attention than you pay similar issues in the lives of others. Uh, it's very, very difficult to miss that point. Now, you don't go through the parable and say, you know, I, I wonder if it matters which eye. Is it the left eye or the right eye? I wonder what the log specifically stands for. I wonder a speck of what? Uh, there's there are certain types of wood in the Holy Land that produce really tiny splinters and probably no, 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 no. That's that. Again, you're you're conducting an autopsy on what Jesus said and uh, and, and you're killing it. Uh, let it let it let it stand there and, and, and sort of drop the bomb that it does. And um, let me let me walk you through some some things that are the uh, sort of um, analysis of the passage as we don't take the parable too far apart. First, Jesus opens with a prohibition. Maybe the single most misunderstood prohibition in all of Scripture. Um, years and years ago, I want to be clear about this because I'm every time when I tell a story in my public teaching about someone who's spoken to me as a counselee, I wonder if the counselees that have seen me this week wonder how many years it will be before their story becomes pulpit fodder. I don't generally do that. Uh, I probably have. 200 counseling appointments for every one that generates a moment that I will use as an illustration. But this was such a great illustration of, of a truth. A gentleman came into my office and sat down years. I, I said years and years ago, right? Years and years ago. And we prayed. We talked for a few minutes. And, and I eventually said, well, you know, how can I how can I pray with you today? What do we need to talk about? And, uh, and he said, well, I'm not I'm not pleased that it's happened, but uh, I have I have become involved with a woman that's that's not my wife and you know he had already shared that there were some difficulties in the marriage and, and things were not necessarily going great in the marriage but by the time he and I talked he was sleeping with a woman that, that to whom he was not married and I leaned back in my chair and I said you know adultery is deadly serious stuff and he said to me hey I didn't come here for you to judge me I'm sure he had in mind Matthew 7, 1, judge not that you be not judged. Here's, here's the problem with his viewpoint. I wasn't judging him. He had told me he was sleeping with a woman to whom he was not married while he was married to his wife. By definition, that makes him an adulterer. Uh, here's a simple, I don't use object lessons a lot because I don't do them terribly well, but here's an object lesson. I, uh, I rated I rated the the, the kitchen drawer and, and and actually Gail did it for me. Gail found me this ruler. And uh, for the purpose of our illustration, let's you and I pretend that we know with absolute certainty that this is a good ruler. I don't think it's a gag item. It looks like a good ruler to me. And I, I and I have a pen. Um, I'm going to I'm going to put this ruler here and put this pen here and I am going to conclude. 
It's not utterly precise, but it's real close. This pin in its present cap on configuration is five and a quarter inches long. Have I judged the pin? The right answer is no. What I've done is apply an external, fixed, accurate standard. There's no judgment involved at all. There is a, an evaluation and a conclusion that is reached based on what is incontrovertible fact. Jesus is not saying here, don't do that. In fact, various places all over, both the Old Testament and New Testament, God's people are encouraged to be discerning, to be observant, to be accountable. In the, in the very, next para, uh, very next verse after the end of this parable, Jesus is going to say, don't give dogs what's holy and don't throw your pearls before pigs. Dogs and pigs in, in chapter 7, verse 6, within just a few verses. He's talking about people. And you can't obey what he's saying in Matthew 7, 6 if you're not willing to reach the conclusion, this might be a dog, this might be a pig, whatever those things mean. And that's a study for a different day. My point is, he's not saying don't look at people in a discerning way. He's saying, oh, oh, and just, just for grins and giggles, uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus actually commands, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgments. So the next time someone who's living in sin accuses you of being judgmental when you point out that they are in violation of God's word, and they say, judge not that you be not judged, you smile and say, in John 7, 24, Jesus told me to judge with right judgment. So what does he mean in Matthew 7, 1? He means don't apply subjective standards. Don't apply um, uh, assumptions regarding people's motives. In short, don't make up stuff. One of the reasons our church discipline process at McGregor is so slow and so careful is we want to make certain. Remember, our, our church discipline process starts with someone who is in public, unrepented of, um, serious, grievous sin. Uh, not someone that we think we heard that somebody said that there might be, we can't, we can't jump on that or we are violating. But to sit around and say, well, I know what he's thinking, or I know why she did that, or, you know, they're just the kind of person who you're, you're disobeying the Lord. Um, just don't do those things. In that sense, there's a prohibition here. Don't be a person who is judgmental in the sense of, of, of ascribing motive or thinking you know what's going on. Uh, keep the word picture of very carefully holding something up against you know, that, that fixed accurate standard for you and me that of course is first and foremost the word of god so that's the prohibition in verse one verse two speaks of proportion uh he says for with the judgment you pronounce you will be judged and with the measure you use it will be measured to you now he's not he's not talking about retribution he's encouraging grace in effect he's saying those of you who would long for the grace of god and that should be every single one of you who understands his standing before a holy God. Those of you who long for the grace of God, surely you would know you ought to be gracious in your dealings with others. One of the great mysteries of the universe, and I, I, I am not, I'm, I'm not real proud that this has been me at times in the past and probably will be me again. Um, but I, 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 I strive to catch myself being un when I'm being ungracious. One of the great self deny or our self denying behaviors um, in a bad way. We, we, we dishonor the Lord and we dishonor who he has made us to be when we are not gracious in our dealings with others. When we, when we assume the worst, love hopes all things, love assumes the best. And so when, when someone is behaving in a way we find puzzling and we, immediately crash around the least favorable version of what's going on. And we sort of make that rush to judgment. Jesus here is saying, remember, you if you're a Christian, you are a grace recipient. Be a gracious person. So there's a, there's a proportion. Those of us who love grace 
should love grace in our dealings. If we have received grace in the in the in the uh, vertical from the living God, we should be gracious in the horizontal in our relationship with each other. The third the third thing he comes to in the passage is the parable itself. If you're an outliner, the prohibition, the proportion, and now the actual parable. And again, the subtype of this is is a a metaphor because there is no storyline here. There's no beginning, middle, and end. Uh, what Jesus is saying is, you're like this, um, sort of a simile or a metaphor. You're like this. When you go around um, nitpicking the flaws in other people's lives, you're like someone who has got a great big piece of firewood stuck in his eye, who thinks that he's best qualified to go around pulling splinters out of other people's eyes. It's it's a foolish, ridiculous contrast meant to make a quite serious point that that we all have plenty to work on in our own growth and character and development. Notice he does not, Gibson wanted to say hi. Notice he did not say to be uninvolved or unhelpful or unengaged in in dealing with things that need dealing with in the lives of others. Um, in fact, he's gonna he's gonna be real clear that he's absolutely not saying that. We will and are sometimes uh, in the best position to respond to God's uh, will for us and God's God's prompting from His Word, God's prompting in in our heart by the Spirit. You may at times be the one who has to approach somebody that you love and care about and say, you know, there's something in your life that's that's puzzling to me. There's something in your life that seems to be off and, and you and I need to talk. Um, what Jesus is here saying is if you're going to be used of God in that way, your most your most thoroughgoing examination, looking for the flaws and looking for the faults and looking for the things that need to be corrected, your most rigorous um, exercise of looking for those flaws needs to be when you look for your own. You need to be harder on yourself as a judge of character than you are on anybody else. That's what Jesus is saying. And and that's the, the sort of the punch of this particular parable. And then, fourth thing on the outline, the, the, the next uh, couple of verses, he says, um, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. It's not that you're not involved. Uh, it's that you're, you're attentive to yourself. And, and, and this, this procedure that he outlines there in verse 5, uh, I have written in the margin of my Bible out beside that. There's, there's an expanded version of that. And, and it will be coming up in, in just a couple Sundays on Sunday morning at McGregor because it's in Galatians. It's still ahead of us in Galatians. Galatians chapter 6, um, first, first few verses speaks to the first couple of verses speaks to this very thing. When Paul wrote Galatians 6, 1 and 2, God the Holy Spirit was having him add color commentary to what Jesus had said in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Galatians 6, 1 and 2 says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, that is, if you have a brother or a sister with a speck in their eye, you who are spiritual should restore him, not should leave him alone, not, well, whatever you do, don't judge him, but you should be involved in the restoration in a spirit of gentleness, keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. It is precisely the same truth that Jesus is expressing back in Matthew 7. Be involved in uh, challenging and encouraging the people that are that are connected to your life, but Make certain when you approach them, you're gentle. And when you approach yourself, you're deliberate and, you know, 
harsher on you than you are on anybody else. We joke all the time that I am my biggest problem, and, and it's absolutely true. But one of the reasons that doesn't drive me batty is because I am I am, and one of the reasons you don't drive me batty, and none of you do, is that I know that about you. I know that you are dealing with your biggest problem, which is you. Um, I've, I've known people who know that. They're pretty easy to get along with. I've known people who don't know that. They can be hard to get along with because they think the world is their problem or they think the devil is their problem. And those things are problems. But the big problem is you. Um, and Jesus is reminding us of that as well. Get those logs out of our minds. Pastor Mark, that is um, the metaphor parable of the log and the speck. Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5. Oh, no, you know, um, yeah, the word of God that is, that is, that is so quick and so, that is so sharp that, that it can divide even between soul and spirit. Um, the, the word of God is a sharp instrument that God, the Holy Spirit uses in my study of the word of God, the principal person that feels those sharp edged cuts of the word of God is me. Uh, and that's as it should be. God, the Holy Spirit, speaking to me through his word, cuts. Hey, I, I was um, muted when I when I asked that question or when I made that. So they didn't uh, hear what I said. So, <laughs> Oh, I did because I have you on Skype. <laughs> yes, you, you heard me Oops. fine. Yeah, what I, what I, what I said was uh, you had, you had, the challenge there was that we should be looking at the flaw, spend, spend most of the time looking for the flaws in our own lives rather than looking at flaws in other people's. And I said, but that's not fun. It's, the fun part is finding flaws in other people's lives, but that's not what we should be doing. And that's, that's the, the answer you gave. And, and you know, Mark, even, even a couple of weeks ago when we talked about those four big lies, remember the, I think the third of the four big lies was if I can find somebody else to blame, I can take the heat off myself. And, and, and all the way back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, We'd much rather talk about uh, that's what's wrong. He's what's wrong. She's what's wrong. That's a whole lot less rigorous than having to go, okay, somebody love me enough to help me see where I'm wrong. And the word of God, of course, will do that for us as well. Apparently, uh, they still can't hear me. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I've unmuted my mic. Uh, I've tried everything. So, hmm. Well, Guess what? Y'all who cannot... If you can't hear Mark, but you can hear me, he's saying some good stuff. And and the, and the point again, he's the point that he's raising is that that our intuition makes us want to be you know sort of the arch persecutors of everybody else, while we we tend to give ourselves a break, and and that's just not a good idea. Um, don't uh, don't be easy on yourself in this era of I'm okay and self love and all of those things. Ironically, one of the ways you can most honor yourself as the special child of God and image of God bearer that you are is to seek to honor the Lord with your life. That is loving behavior toward yourself. Don't cuddle your sin. Come at it. And uh, right. we'll use that. And like you said, for me, that's that can be challenging at times. But boy, is that uh, that's what God's word has called us to do. Uh, I think they can hear me now, Russell. I think we're good oh, on that. Good. So, yeah. I'm hey, thank you. Thank you so much for kicking off our, our series on the parables of Jesus. What a great, uh, great study. Uh, even though the, the study part was actually short, the introduction might have been the most important part. And hopefully we'll kind of reiterate some of those things over the next several weeks just to make sure that we all understand uh, maybe even some of the ground rules for studying the parables, if you want to call them that. Uh, because as we said at the beginning, there it, it's easy to misinterpret those. And I love what you said during your introduction about trying to put ourselves as best as we can in the original hearer's sandals. I mean, that's how we should study scripture anyway, but obviously with the parables, that part is is super, super important. And so, yeah, thanks again. That was great, great study. 
Thanks, Mark. I mean, I appreciate the opportunity. It, it still feels weird to be sitting here at my uh, at my kitchen counter uh, with with dogs underfoot, and and uh, as opposed to you know the 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 podium setting in Fellowship Hall or H100. But I am so grateful we can do it this way. All right. Well, we will wrap up. Thank you for joining us. Hope to see you next Wednesday night. And if you haven't signed up, registered for this course or any of our other JT online classes, you can go to mcgregor.net slash journey to register. Go ahead and do that right now as we sign off. And we'll see you Sunday, either 8, 930 or 11, either in person on campus or online. God bless. Have a great evening. Good night.